gentlemen, start if uh, we might. Uh, my name is Catherine Moon and I chair the Germany Group. So we have a mixture of Germano fields and economy fields here. But as a group, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Coots with us at the moment. He holds an MSc and a PhD in economics from the University of Münster. He's been with the Keele Institute for the World Economy since 2010. Since 2014, he's been head of the Forecasting Centre, uh, which is the Institute's macroeconomic think tank and big business cycle analysis unit. And in 2013, he was appointed Professor of Economics at the University of Applied Sciences Europe in Berlin, where he initiated, which I hope we get around to talk about, Europe's first master programme in entrepreneurial economics. So he will... Uh, give his talk, which will be on the record, then we'll move to question and answer, which will be off the record, and at that stage I'll ask people to identify themselves, and if I could ask you please to turn off your mobile phones. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, distinguished institute. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I must apologize, I'm slightly handicapped uh, health-wise. Um, last week I spent two days um, talking to central bankers in Frankfurt on their monetary policy stance and it seems that this has not left my voice uh, unaffected. <laughs> but I do my very best. Um, normally I would be a little bit more vivid, uh, but I try to well, pretend perform we're, as pretend best. Pretend central bankers. <laughs> <laughs> I try to perform as best as I can. All right, um, well, first of all, this title, you might wonder why is there a question mark in it? Isn't the Kiel Institute known for saying for a couple of years already that there is a risk of overheating uh, in Germany and uh, why a question mark then? Well, it was your title that you suggested and it, I did not uh, dare changing it. But there's only one question mark in it. And a year ago, there would have been a second question mark already behind, is there a boom in Germany at all? Well, this question is over. Now, practically everyone agrees um, in the forecasting community, in the macroeconomic community, yes, there is a boom going on uh, in uh, Germany. So we only have to tackle with the second question mark. Um, is this sowing the seeds of a crisis? And uh, let me start uh, with a kind of textbook-like uh, um, exposition first. Um, what macroeconomists are concerned of is that actual production could deviate too much from potential output, so that we have overcapacity utilization. And you may ask yourself, what's so bad about overcapacity utilization? Isn't it great to, to have a boom, to produce even more than you would sustainably be able to? Well, it's not good news um, to deviate um, from potential output um, because it is in the boom, and I will come back to this later in my uh, talk, it's in the boom that we are um, seeing business models um, emerging that are non-sustainable. The boom by itself is non-sustainable. It's an overstretching of uh, capacity uh, um, utilization and therefore we are allocating scarce resources to uses that at the end of their boom will turn out to be a misallocation. And therefore the boom and the um, exaggerations during the booms are the true cause for the subsequent recession. So the more exaggeration we see in the boom, the deeper the correcting recession has to be. So if you want, if you're really interested in stabilizing the business cycle, do something about dampening the boom. This is the best recipe for not getting into a too deep recession. Unfortunately, mainstream macroeconomic policy making has it rather the other way around. Once the crisis is there, people say, okay, now we have to spend more, or we have to lower interest rates, or whatever. Um, it is a much better idea of really stabilizing uh, an economy 
um, by preventing the boom to develop too strongly. Unfortunately, from the political economics perspective, this is an extremely difficult task to do because the boom just feels good. Uh, it feels good. So easy. Taxpayers, uh, um, um, tax revenues uh, are coming in like crazy. Um, budget deficits are shrinking or you even are running surpluses and lots of money there that waits to be spent. And this is exactly the time when most of the uh, most important um, political mistakes are made. And we're not only talking about technocratic business cycle stabilization, we are talking about human things. Think of the real estate boom in Spain. Uh, at the peak of the boom, 25% of the male labor force worked for the construction sector. And they were qualified people, qualified workers, skilled worker working there, but skilled for the construction business. And once this boom was over, these people fell back on their next best productivity level and this very often wasn't really significantly above that of an unskilled person. So we are really talking about human well-being when we are trying to prevent these uh, artificial booms from growing more and more. It's not only a macroeconomic um, technocratic uh, fetish that we are following here. And where's Germany? Well, According to our current diagnosis, already um, in boom territory uh, and we are approaching the peak of this boom. And uh, let me very briefly show you uh, why we come to this conclusion, why also others um, follow us uh, now in this conclusion by uh, some forecasting and diagnostic uh, material. And in the second part of, a talk, of the talk I will uh, very briefly say something about what is policy, what are policy makers supposed to do now and what are they uh, most likely um, doing. Well, um, we are drifting towards overheating. What you see here in the bars uh, is the degree of uh, overcapacity utilization. If they are in positive territory, then the degree is <coughs> overcapacity utilization. If you're below the zero line, this means we are underutilizing our economic um, capacities. And uh, what we are observing for five years in a row now is a very stretched upswing, unusually um, stretched. Uh, therefore, we coined the term, it's like a chewing gum um, cycle. It takes much longer than usual for the typical cyclical pattern to develop. And therefore, it was really difficult to diagnose uh, in the first time. But now it becomes quite clear when you look at 2017, we are talking about positive output gas nearly to 2%. And this is a lot, believe me. In macroeconomic terms, this is a lot. And as you will see, this is not even the end uh, of the story. All this has been possible also due to uh, labor migration, which has led to also an increase of our potential growth rate without the immigration of labor. We are not talking about the refugees, it's a different story, but the, the normal way of labor migration into Germany, in particular from the eastern uh, member states uh, of the European Union, they have uh, contributed. Uh, contributed um, uh, massively to um, the growth uh, path here in Germany. But today, capacity utilization is above normal levels, and it's high above normal levels. Um, you may say, well, these uh, potential output estimations are to some extent questionable, they are difficult. Yes, that's true, but we have other indicators as well. In particular, we have surveys, we have asking firms What's about your capacity utilization? And whatever industry you look at, you will get more or less the same answer. We are way above normal capacity utilization um, level. This is true for manufacturing. Construction sector is already at their capacity limits. They are booming already for a couple of years. And even if you look in the services sectors, Statistics are not that developed in this sector, but even there, the information that we have is 
um, they are running out of production uh, capacity. The most important factor that they report uh, to in surveys that prevents them from producing more is that they are running out of labor. Uh, so all these are clear signs of uh, overcapacity utilization. And uh, this is our current GDP forecast after 2.2% last year, another 2.5% this year. This is way above potential output growth, which is around 1.7% uh, in Germany, also elevated a little bit stronger than normal. I come back to this later. And um, every year that you see GDP expanding stronger than potential output is growing, you're adding up to overcapacity utilization. Um, and I don't want to go into all these details here, but all the short-term indicators that we have clearly indicate we will have a very strong first quarter, probably then a kind of weaker one, but the underlying trend is still uh, clearly upwards towards um, higher capacity utilization. And this is a broad-based expansion. Um, very often you see in the business or the macroeconomic um, reporting that people are looking at net exports and their growth contribution of net exports. And then they come to the conclusion, oh, Germany is only domestically driven. This is nonsense because netting out exports and imports would imply that all imports are only used for producing export goods, which is obviously not the case. So what we are doing is we are allocating via input-output um, calculations um, the imports that we are expecting to the different uses, to consumption goods, investment goods, and export goods. And if you do this exercise, then you see that Germany is currently uh, very much driven again by external uh, business. As you know, the external environment has improved a lot. In particular, in the euro area, the euro area, even without Germany, is already also in positive territory in terms of the output gap. I think this has kind of um, happened without being noticed really by, by policymakers. So the alarm uh, ring should really beyond now uh, for everyone who is um, concerned about business cycle stabilization. And again, if you look at credit expansion uh, in the euro area, it looks kind of normal on average. But the two driving factors, or there are only two driving factors, one is France, number one, and number two is Germany. In these two countries alone, today account for credit expansion in the euro area. And again, looking at the euro area average can be extremely misleading, yeah? as it was with respect to inflation rates prior to the European debt crisis, when the ECB was on target 10 years in a row, very proud, um, but uh, obviously something can happen below the radar of inflation rates that uh, produce a lot of uh, turmoil in our um, in uh, our economies. So, very strong impact of the external economy, of the external environment. Um, consumption is not that strong anymore, but still strong for German um, um, yeah, for what Germans are used to. And now, what we typically see or what we expect in such a boom. Um, investment spending is accelerating. I don't want to go too much uh, into the details here. Again, the message is exports are back on track, not as dynamic as they were prior to the Great Recession, but we anyway have to accustom ourselves now to more normal times. What we have seen prior to 2007 was not the standard uh, way of uh, economic operations. And are we very concerned about the protectionist wave that is rushing through the world economy, well, of course we are concerned, but we do not really believe that we will see something like an escalating trade conflict. And this is because the whole debate is too trade-centristic. Uh, if you look at uh, the transatlantic economic space, what we see is they are much more interwoven via capital flows than via trade flows. 
And uh, what I've showed you here is are the trade um, shares of, of uh, trade from US from the um, EU to the US and uh, from the US into the EU. Uh, into the EU. Um, it looks like well, trade seems to be more important for European exporters than for American exporters. But if you look at the foreign direct investment positions, the picture is quite different. Then you see that the exposure of the United States in Europe, in the European single market, is much more important than the other way around. And just compare the sales volumes of US-owned affiliates in the European single market compared to the export <coughs> so out of uh, um, the United States, then you see that the business that the affiliates are making in the European Union are much, much more important than their exports. And uh, we believe that once the president tries to trigger such a trade conflict and mm, disturbs the economic functioning of the EU, then the vi then vital interests in the United States would be affected and they would um, push for a more rational uh, um, policy stance vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Um, so just thinking in terms of retaliation measures, we think it's a very bad idea. It's much better to focus on where is our um, mutual benefit out of having an integrated transatlantic space. And I think there are very important people in the United States who would support this. So therefore, we are not that alarmed. We are concerned, of course, as anyone else is. But if we think there are good reasons that we will not see this escalating trade conflict in the transatlantic Europe, um, economic space. As I said, construction activity is already booming. Um, we have now um, order books that are piling up, coming near to the peaks in the mid-1990s. And this was when we really had a very um, pronounced construction boom. After your reunification, it was probably unavoidable. Um, but the reason that Germany became the chief <coughs> man of Europe in the second half of the 90s and the first half of the um, 2000s was all because we have to shrink this construction sector again. Uh, so, so far we don't, we don't see the construction sector itself expanding that much, which is so far good news, but the order books are already uh, piling up uh, tremendously. Um, Merger, uh, 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 investment in, mer in uh, machinery and equipment, um, yeah, mergers and acquisitions as well, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we have quite a cheap bank now to offer, for if you're interested, um, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> um, investment in machinery and uh, equipment is also picking up, not as pronounced as we would see it in former um, cycles. There are probably at least two reasons or let's say three reasons. One is the whole upswing is very stretched. Therefore, these accelerator effects are much more dampened than they usually are when you see a, a, a quick switch in capacity, capacity utilization rates. It's number one. Number two is maybe, and this is what people from the comp corporate sector tell us, our equipment has become more or the plasticity of our equipment has increased, which means that with the same hardware you can now produce, it's easier to produce new products just by exchanging the software. Um, this might also explain why overall investment in machinery and equipment is kind of subdued. Plus, this country is running out of skilled labor. It's nice to have the machinery, but if you do not have someone who can work with it, then you would rather invest uh, somewhere else where people are still available. So maybe these three reasons together explain why we are expecting, yes, an upswing of <laughs> their investment, uh, spending of corporates, but not as pronounced as we would forecast it if we stick to the patterns that we are used to in the past. Labor market is increasingly tighter. Um, the uh, I've shown you the um, immigration numbers. They will come down also because in those countries the economic situation is improving 
um, tremendously, in particular in the eastern part of uh, the European Union. You see very um, strong growth numbers there, and uh, this makes it less likely that people migrate uh, into uh, Germany. We see it for, we could, could have a whole bunch of indicators here, but all indicators tell us the situation becomes more and more difficult to find. Um, labor, you see it in the unemployment rate. We are approaching, we're not already there, but we're approaching full employment in this country. I wouldn't take the ILO number at face value because we here have important statistical problems to um, have the um, refugee um, immigrants uh, reflected in this number. This is based on telephone surveys and well these people aren't registered anyway and even if someone asked them in German uh, <laughs> are you currently working on a regular basis how would they be uh, so therefore the ILO number is probably over um, it's not that reliable but even registered unemployment is uh, going down below five percent now. Fiscal policy is really not ambitious. You see that uh, although their, their uh, surplus is above 1%, the fiscal uh, surplus uh, budget surplus is above 1% in relation to GDP, but the structural budget balance is shrinking according to the plans of uh, the new government. There will not be a significant impact this year, it's just too late in the fiscal year to do anything uh, uh, that would uh, act as a game changer, uh, and the whole package is kind of end loaded. But next year, you will see already um, some impact of what they are planning. Um, some observers were concerned well, six months without a government, wouldn't this depress business sentiments and have a negative impact on GDP? Well, there's very, very little evidence on that. So if you look at other countries, like Belgium, Spain, Netherlands, who had even longer periods uh, of not having a re-elected government, they fared quite well. And uh, for libertarian, I would say, there are worse things in the world than having, not having a new government. <laughs> All right, so this is clearly nothing that would influence our forecast in any way. The medium term, again, is alarming. Uh, we are seeing the boom, the peak of the boom coming. And uh, if you ask me, how do you come up with this projection that we will then see the recession, uh, or the, the downswing, I sh should say, the downswing coming in 2020? Well, this is not uh, written in stone, of course. But do we have a model for that? Well, not really a model that gives us the exact date, but what we can do is we can look at what were the record high levels of capacity utilization of output gaps that we have observed in the past. And then we come to the conclusion that somewhere around 2020, maybe 21, we will see the end of the story. And then necessarily uh, we will have the uh, beginning of the uh, downside. So um, those who are relying on their eternal boom will be new, will be clearly disappointed. And what we are concerned about is that two effects will be tip or will 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 show up at the beginning of the new decade. One is the downswing, so the correction of the boom. The second is, this is also the beginning when demographics in Germany will no longer be compensated by immigration or higher participation rates of women or elderly people. Then the demographics become the dominating factor for German growth numbers. And <coughs> on average, German growth was 1.5% over the last let's say two, three decades. This will then shrink at least to 1%, maybe even below. The Bundesbank is even skept more skeptical about that. This would not be a problem if just the whole country would shrink. But this is not the case. Most of the people will continue uh, and live, which is good news, by the way, <laughs> but they have to consume out of some income that they are no longer producing. 
And therefore, we see that our social security system come, really come under stress. Yeah? And uh, it's not good news if this beginning of the low growth period is accompanied by a, um, a business cycle adopter. This brings me very quickly to some risk and policy assessments. Very often here, in particular in financial markets, Booms don't die out of, a, of old age, they are murdered by policymakers, in particular by central banks. Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> um, this is logically not possible. Yeah? If a boom would be sustainable, it would no longer be a boom. Then you would just be on a higher growth trajectory. Uh, but which we are not, according to all the indicators that we have. So there is some exaggeration going on. And the problematic thing, again, let me reiterate this of the boom is that business people can no longer distinguish between am I doing good in my business because I have a great product or am I doing good because I'm just swept away with all the others. And, well, look, the natural human response it's my product. Huh? It's my success. So people are tempted to build up business models that are not viable in the long term. And they must be corrected. And this is what, uh, at the end of the day, squanders scare resources. To put it another way, you could, this, this diagram that I've shown in the beginning is somewhat misleading. It could convey the message that, well, sometimes we are above normal, sometimes we are below, but on average it's the same than the growth trend. This is not the case. The more we fluctuate around the trend, the more resource <coughs> misallocation happens in the boom, and the flatter is the overall output trend. Uh, therefore, overall well-being, material well-being, depends on dampening As I said, there are these endogenous distortions that are building up, um, and we are also seeing an easygoing mentality in policy making. I come back on this point on my, on my last slide, second last slide. Um, I would just like to mention very briefly that we must not forget that the whole development, economic development, not only in Germany, but also in the Euro area, but in Germany in particular, is accompanied by absolutely extraordinary monetary policy stance that is trying to bring interest rates down below their market levels. But what does this mean? Well, the ECB says we want to bring up inflation rate back to our target of near 2%. But by so intervening, you do not only affect possibly the average rate of inflation, but you are necessarily affecting relative prices. Every product price, each and every product price, has an interest component in it. And the more distant the product is from its final use for production, the more important this interest rate component is. Therefore, if you're manipulating the interest rate, you're necessarily also manipulating relative prices, and we all know relative prices is what is steering our market economies. Uh, so we're not talking about peanuts here, we are talking about the machine room of our economic system. And we're also not talking about expansionary monetary policy for a year or two years, where it would not cause too much damage. We're talking about an extended period, seven, eight, probably, until we see an exit to this, if we see it, of a whole decade. And a lot can happen in terms of new distortions, new production structures emerging that are again not viable due to the relative price distortion caused by monetary policy. And this spills over to financial stability. The financial crisis is nothing else but a mirror image of a massive, distortions in the physical capital stock of an economy. When it turns out that the physical capital 
capital stock, can no, and all the production structures around it, can no longer provide the yields that are once expected to be um, produced, then you see a financial crisis. Because then you do not have the individual business model that flocks, which is normal in the ongoing business world, but a systemic risk. Too many, due to the too low interest rates, in a systematic way, investors were guided towards a misallocation of capital. And to correct this is extremely painful. painful. Plus, we are currently overestimating, <coughs> rather than underestimating, potential output. This is due to the mechanics, statistical characteristics of our econometric approaches here. So, it is more likely that we are underestimating the current output gap than, than that we are overestimating this. Plus, people take for granted that uh, there are nearly 2 million people who came as um, refugees into our country will stay here. Well, some of them probably will stay. But what happens if there's, again, peace in Syria and the other countries? <coughs> Obviously, many of them would want to go back. So we cannot take for granted that they stay and uh, consider them as if they were already naturally part of the labor stock, uh, the, la sorry, the labor force uh, in Germany. So at least we should be cautious about not taking this for granted. What, uh, and what we are deploring is a very inadequate <coughs> policy response. I've already talked about pro-cyclical fiscal <coughs> policies. I don't want to overstretch it, I would say. It's not as rigorous as it should be, but it's not really extremely pro-cyclical, but at least going in the wrong direction. Okay. But what we are seeing is we are seeing the, an expansion of the welfare state. Huh? And this makes the whole system even less prepared for the demographic change that is coming in the next decade already. It's not coming somewhere in the future, it's coming in a couple of years. It's before the front door, right? Um, and therefore, we are aggravating the intergenerational conflicts that are already quite, or will already be quite strong in the next <laughs> decades. We have a redistribution debate um, that goes along the lines that we want to increase the guaranteed minimum income levels. And this creates perverse incentives for people to become economically active. There's a huge span, roughly 1,000 euros, from someone who's unskilled, who enters the labor market. Um, he, has, he can earn a couple of hundred of euros that he can keep for himself. But then there's a very long period, a very long gap that he has to overcome until his net income increases if he earns more money. And this is a disincentive for becoming part of the labor force and gaining all the qualifications, etc., etc. This is really something that should be tackled. We don't see it, actually, uh, in our current uh, debate. And something that I call the Gulliver syndrome. We are reducing flexibility more and more, and this will make it even more difficult to master the upcoming upswing. Uh, what do I mean by the Gulliver? Um, syndrome is, well, we are introducing a minimum wage, equal pay regulations, a rent break, gender quota, full-time, part-time guarantee, etc., <coughs> etc. Et Each of these policy measures does not keep the economy on the ground and prevent entrepreneurs from becoming active. But it is the sum of all these strings that keep Gulliver on the ground as they keep economic activity uh, on the ground that makes it more difficult for entrepreneurs really to invest in their um, in uh, their business and uh, to take some risks. Um, it's a nonsensical debate just to look at one isolated policy instrument and say this is not doing that much harm. Well, of course it does not do so much harm. <laughs> but even there, even a minimum wage is below the equilibrium wage of the labor market like in southern Germany. And in Munich, a minimum wage of 9 point something euros is nonsensical because the free labor market would uh, show you a higher wage. But nevertheless, 
it is a hindrance to production. Why? Because you have to report that you, or you have to show that you are paying the minimum wage. And it's so easy to circumvent it. Huh? You just make a contract, 30 hours a week. This is in our written contract. But at the same time, we have an agreement, you're working for 40 hours. Huh? So it's very easy to um, go around it. What's the response of the government? Well, even stricter regulations that uh, these uh, extra contractual arrangements are provided. And this is the same for all the other regulations as well. So it's not only that we are interfering with the price mechanism, we are creating a lot of extra bureaucracy, which, if it becomes overwhelming, will be a blocking factor of the economic um, activity. So much um, for our current assessment uh, of the situation in Germany. So we are not having a party in our institute. We are very concerned that people don't take this boom serious and just say, well, nice to have. Um, now is the time to respond, but we so far do not see the debate and the policy response that would be adequate. Welcome to the <laughs> <laughs>